Okay, so you are here for how to improve your mental toughness. That is the name of the lecture. I'm going to start with an introduction that has four opening points. Those points are the origins of this lecture, what is mental toughness, you can change, and then an outline for the rest of it. So the origins of this. Um, I'm very interested in baseball. That is my other obsession other than debate, um, or one of my other obsessions. And in baseball, over the last five to six years, there's been an explosion of mental skills training um, at the major league and minor league and college levels. And uh, the uh, idea that baseball players need mental training in addition to physical training is something that used to be frowned upon or laughed at. And it used to be that uh, you were weak or you were uh, you're not a competitor, you weren't tough enough if you um, had to think about the anxiety that you felt about your performance or you had to think about how to prepare yourself mentally to excel and to deal with failure and that kind of thing. But uh, Major League Baseball teams have figured out and other professional sports organizations and major companies and the military and um, all sorts of uh, people have figured out that uh, mental skills training is essential to success in any competitive environment. And so. Uh, uh, Joe Mann, who's the manager of the Chicago Cubs, said it's no different than your hitting coach, your pitching coach, your infield coach. A mental skills coach is going to help you think better, think more clearly in the moment, and control your emotions. And uh, the growth of mental skills training in Major League Baseball fascinates me, and I see a lot of parallels to debate. It's, a, it's not the exact same thing, um, but we also are in a high-pressure environment. We're also playing a game that's challenging. You also have to deal with failure when you're in debate. Um, you have to deal with the anxiety of competition and the uncertainty of whether you're going to succeed or not. And so I've read a ton about uh, mental skills training and mental skills coaching um, and mental toughness, and I have tried to distill some of that, um, what I've learned from sports psychologists, mental skills coaches, and other people like that, um, into uh, lessons that I can teach debaters. And so at the HSS, we started a mental preparation program in 2017, and we've expanded it uh, since. I've done a series of lectures that are related. I would recommend a companion lecture to this called How to Debate Your Best at Tournaments, which is on my YouTube channel. There's not much overlap between this and that, but there's a lot of um, useful tips in that lecture that will also help you um, deal with the things that I'm going to talk about. So this lecture is part of that program. Um, it's going to draw heavily upon quotations and, and things that I've learned from mental skills coaches and sports psychologists, um, and I will quote them throughout uh, the lecture. So the second introductory point is, what is mental toughness? What is mental toughness? So I call this lecture, How to Improve Your Mental Toughness. Um, there are three quotes that I like about mental toughness. The first one is from Lauren Abarca, who's the mental conditioning coach for the New York Yankees. She says, mental toughness is coping with the things you can't control by focusing on the things you can. Coping with the things you can't control by focusing on the things you can. Uh, and then there are two from Tim Grover. So the second one, uh, he is a performance trainer. He's most known for being the personal uh, coach for Michael Jordan. He also coached many other uh, NBA superstars and continues to do so. He says, mental toughness means you don't believe the hype when you win and you don't fall apart when you lose. You don't believe the hype when you win. You don't fall apart when you lose. And the third quote also from Grover is, mental toughness doesn't guarantee that you'll win, but competing without it usually guarantees that you won't. Competing with it doesn't guarantee you'll win, but competing without it usually guarantees you won't. Uh, I'll kind of operationalize what I mean by mental toughness throughout, um, but a mentally tough uh, debater is confident. They are capable of managing the anxiety that comes with competition, and they're capable of coping with uh, adversity and failure. The third point in the introduction is that you can change. You can change. One of the most important things that I have learned from studying mental skills training and sports psychology is that all of this stuff is not inherent. It is not intrinsic. It is learned, and it can be changed and improved. You're not born a mentally tough competitor or a mentally weak competitor. Uh, it depends on your training and your circumstances, and you can get better, just like you can get better at speaking or research or your 1AR. Uh, Justin Sua, who's one of my favorites, I'll quote him heavily, he's now the Major League Mental Skills Coach with the Tampa Bay Rays, so he sits in the dugout during games to help players um, manage their competitive anxieties and have the right mindset as they're playing. Uh, the Rays are one of the first teams that have done that, but I think that's pretty cool. There's a, a mental coach in the dugout during games. He says, don't be held captive by your default settings. You can learn how to respond better to stress. You can shed old habits. You can evolve from the person you are into the person you aspire to be. You don't have to be what you have been. Fourth and finally, uh, as an introductory point, is the outline. So I've divided this into the three main sections that I teased in the description. Improving your confidence, managing competitive anxiety, and coping with adversity and failure. Under each of those sections, I've organized the lecture into a series of numbered points. Hopefully that will help with your flowability or your note taking. Um, and there are uh, seven points under improving confidence. There are 17 points <coughs> under managing competitive anxiety. And there are six points under coping with adversity 
and failure for those of you who want to have a sense of what's to come. So Roman numeral one, or main section number one, improving your confidence. Improving your confidence. First, confidence. What is it? What is confidence? Jim Taylor, who's a sports psychologist who's worked with professional athletes and Olympic athletes, um, and who is a very well-known uh, mental skills trainer, says confidence is the single most important mental factor in sports. I define confidence as how strongly you believe in your ability to achieve your goals. Confidence is so important because you may have all of the ability in the world to perform well, but if you don't believe that you have that ability, then you won't perform up to that ability. Your goal uh, when you're developing your confidence is to achieve what Taylor calls prime confidence. He says prime confidence is a deep, lasting, and resilient belief in one's ability. With prime confidence, you are able to stay confident even when you're not performing well. Prime confidence keeps you positive, motivated, intense, focused, and emotionally in control when you need to be. You aren't negative and uncertain in difficult competitions, and you're not overconfident in easy competitions. Prime confidence also encourages you to seek out pressure situations and to view difficult conditions and tough opponents as challenges to pursue. Prime confidence enables you to perform at your highest level consistently. Now, it's important to distinguish confidence from arrogance or cockiness or brashness. Taylor says, prime confidence is the belief that if you do the right things, you will be successful. Prime confidence demonstrates faith in your ability and your preparation. It should not, however, cause you to expect success. This belief can lead to arrogance and overconfidence. It can also cause you to become too focused on winning rather than on performing your best. This perception can lead to self-imposed pressure and a fear of failure. Finally, under this uh, point, confidence is extremely important. Jonathan Fader, who is the director of mental conditioning for the New York Giants, the football team, and he used to be the team psychologist for the New York Mets baseball team, says confidence is the foundation of many mental skills for performance. If you've lost confidence, not only will your overall performance decline, but you're far more likely to choke up. For most elite athletes, the ability to remain mentally tough and remain confident is the one skill that puts them ahead of the rest. Second point, it's not just you. It's not just you. Dr. Nicole Detling, who's a mental performance coach for Olympic athletes and some professional athletes, says, if you're insecure, guess what? The rest of the world is too. Do not overestimate the competition and underestimate yourself. You are better than you think. A lack of confidence is one of the main issues that I confront working with students uh, in debate. And it's one of the most common issues that professional athletes struggle with. For a long time, as I mentioned before, it wasn't okay to say that. It was embarrassing to say, that I, I, I lack self-confidence, that I'm worried that I'm not good, that I don't know that if, if I can do it, that I'm, I'm, I'm feeling anxious, I'm feeling depressed, I'm feeling uh, like I'm, I, I just don't want to do it anymore, I'm feeling burned out. That's what it's like to be a human. And all humans experience those feelings at various times. Even people that you think are the most confident people in the world, they struggle, uh, they, they don't show it to you, but they struggle with confidence too. Uh, this uh, confident, the, the struggle with confidence is particularly pernicious because it makes us feel isolated. We feel like, yeah, not only are we not good at debate, not only are we not capable of winning this debate, but uh, we're, we're just such pathetic people that, uh, that we're the only ones struggling with this. I see my opponents and they're, they're confident, they don't have this problem. So I'm, I'm, I'm so bad that then I, I come up with more reasons that I'm bad. I'm the only one that's struggling with this. But we share the same problems as others, and I think knowing that can help you cope, because this is not something that is just you. This is something that everyone struggles with, uh, and so others have improved, you can improve. Which brings me to point three. It's a skill you can develop. It's a skill you can develop. Jim Taylor says, a misconception that many athletes have is that confidence is something that is inborn, or that if you don't have it at an early age, you will never have that confidence. In reality, confidence is a skill, much like technical skills, that can be learned. Just like with any type of skill, confidence is developed through focus, effort, and repetition. The way he describes it uh, is it's really more like a habit than an inherent trait. I like that framing. He says the problem is that you have the option to practice good or bad confidence skills. If you are very negative all the time, you are practicing and ingraining those negative confidence skills. So when you compete, just like a bad technical habit, that negativity is what will come out and it will hurt your performance. In other words, you become highly skilled at something that actually hurts your sports performance. In debate, the explanation of that or the, the context of that is that if you develop these negative beliefs about yourself, then you're going to get better at having negative beliefs. And so when you're put into the pressure situation of a tournament round, of a competition, you're really good at coming up with negative thoughts. You're really good at convincing yourself that you can't do it. You're really good at finding the negative in everything. Uh, but that also means that you can change your habit. 
Taylor says, to change bad confidence skills, you must retrain the way you think. You have to practice good confidence skills regularly until the old negative habits have been broken and you have learned and ingrained the new positive skills of confidence. Uh, point number four, stop comparing yourself to others. One of the most common causes of low confidence is an unhealthy comparison of oneself to others. Justin Sua says you should refuse to be threatened, jealous, or intimidated by the success of others. Focus on your own process, progress, and purpose. There's a, there's a healthy way to look at others and to look up to them and to be impressed by them, and then there is an unhealthy way. The healthy way uh, is to be inspired by them. Sua says positive people are inspired by the success of others. They look at those who are excelling and ask themselves the question, what can I learn from them? Negative people become jealous and threatened by the success of others. To negative people, when others succeed, it means they are failing. The comparison you need to learn to make is to the previous version of yourself, not to other people. Brad Stolberg, who's a mental performance coach, says the most important person you should aim to beat is a prior version of yourself. This is how you keep getting better. And Adam Grant, who's an organizational psychologist at the Wharton School at uh, University of Pennsylvania, says don't strive to be the best. That creates an illusion of an endpoint and a delusion that the goal is to be superior to others. Strive to be better. The person you're competing with is your past self, and the bar you're setting is for your future self. Uh, this is hard, and this is something that is at the root of a lot of people's confidence issues, but by reframing the point of your development from I'm going to be better than that person, or I'm going to be the best in my circuit, or I'm going to be the best that there is, uh, into I'm going to be better than my prior version, I'm going to be the best version of myself, you'll be amazed at how much your confidence can improve. Point number five. Compete for yourself. Compete for yourself. I would imagine that many of you have become familiar with intrinsic versus extrinsic motivation through your school's curriculum. I bet a lot of you have learned about the growth mindset. A lot of you have learned about uh, grit and resiliency. Uh, in this context, what I mean is that you need to have intrinsic motivation to compete and to succeed and to become the best version of yourself. You can't have extrinsic motivation. You can't be doing it for others. John Wooden, who is, the, in my opinion, the greatest coach of anything of all time. Uh, he won 10 NCAA men's national uh, basketball championships. He, won, he received from President Obama before he died the Presidential Medal of Freedom. Um, he says the only pressure that amounts to a hill of beans is the pressure you put on yourself. If you're trying to live up to expectations put on you by the media, parents, fans, your employer, or whatever else they may be, it's going to affect you adversely because it brings on worry and anxiety. I think that is the tendency of people who choke under pressure. They're thinking about living up to the expectations of everybody else instead of just doing their job the best they can. There was an interesting study of NBA free throw shooting, uh, and it found that road teams make a lot more clutch free throws than home teams. Uh, and while it's not possible to prove this, the speculation of experts is that home players are worried about letting down their home fans. They're shooting those free throws, free throws on behalf of the fans that are cheering for them, whereas road teams ha don't have that pressure. They're just trying to win the game for themselves. And I think the same thing is true in debate. If you're trying to win the debate for your partner, or for your coach, or for your parents, or for your alums, or for your school, or for whoever, for your friends, uh, you're putting a lot of pressure on yourself that you can't control. You need to compete for yourself, and the pressure that you place on yourself has to be internally directed. It has to be from you. You have to be the one uh, that is running your debate life. You can't do it for someone else, and trying to do it for someone else often is the reason that we lose our confidence, because we say, well, I couldn't possibly live up to the expectation of others. Who cares? Have expectations of yourself. Number six. Write down your accomplishments. Write down your accomplishments. People with poor uh, self-confidence and poor self-esteem uh, tend not to want to do this. Uh, they don't want to say anything good about themselves because that would require piercing this, this uh, veil that they have created or this shell they have created that protects them from criticism. If you say that you're bad, then it doesn't matter if other people say that you're bad because you've protected yourself. You, you already know that you're bad. And so saying anything good about yourself leaves you vulnerable to someone else criticizing you. But doing it can be incredibly powerful in reframing the way you think about yourself and in boosting your confidence. Justin Sua says it's easy to beat up on yourself. It's easy to compare your weaknesses to the strength of others. It's easy to neglect the good things that you're doing. Don't forget how far you've come, how strong you've gotten, and that you're capable to do anything you set your mind to. You should inventory your accomplishments. This can be outcomes. Uh, you, you won a debate that was difficult. You've completed a research project that was difficult. Um, but it's more useful to know process-based accomplishments, and I'll talk more about the difference later. But whenever you do something difficult, write it down. Keep track. Uh, when you make progress, make a note of that. Keep an accomplishment journal. It can be a file on your computer or it can be in a physical journal. But return to it often. Uh, 
and when you are struggling or when you're feeling like you can't do it and you, you're just terrible, go back and look through that accomplishments journal and see, no, it's not that I'm terrible. Sometimes I fail, but sometimes I succeed. And here's proof. Number seven, thoroughly prepare. Thoroughly prepare. Some people feel comfortable without being completely prepared. Uh, but that tends to never work for people who are struggling with confidence issues. If you have confidence issues, preparation is essential to your mental well-being as you approach competition. Matt Daniels, who's the head of pitching programs at Driveline Baseball, um, I've discussed that in our lab, but Driveline Baseball is a, a big inspiration for the way that I try to coach debate. It's data-driven. Uh, it utilizes the most current um, analytical approaches to training. Um, they're very open-minded and scientific about their approach, and they, uh, have a, they appreciate the mental aspects of the game. Uh, so Matt Daniels is the head of part of the program there. He says, preparation is hands down the best source of confidence going into competition. If you have inferior preparation to a similarly skilled opponent, you're not going to feel confident. I don't care how many breaths you take or how many signs or labels you stare at. Uh, and we're going to talk about some of those uh, techniques like breathing um, and centering. But his point is, it's hard to be confident if you're not ready. And if you are ready, it's much easier to be confident. Hannah Huseman, who's a mental skills coach for the Philadelphia Phillies, says high pressure situation, try thinking less and trusting more. Trust your training, trust your coach, trust yourself. And it's much easier to do that when you're feeling well prepared. So a big part of confidence is preparation. And therefore, you can kind of reframe or rethink everything else that you do to get ready for a tournament as confidence training. When you're doing your research, when you're organizing your files, when you're giving your practice speeches, those are, those are practice for those specific things, but it's also confidence training. And don't forget that. Uh, number eight, I lied and said there were seven, but there were eight because I misnumbered them. Uh, number eight is use positive self-talk. There's actually nine. Use positive self-talk. Uh, Jonathan Fader, the Giants uh, Director of Mental Conditioning, says repeating positive statements about yourself has been shown to decrease the likelihood of losing your confidence, which can keep you focused throughout the game. Remember, the statement should be based on fact. It's not just positive thinking that helps. It's positive statements that are true. I've succeeded in this situation before is a much more effective self-statement than I can do this. There are many studies to support this. Uh, one good one uh, in the psychology of sport and exercise uh, concluded that self-talk can enhance self-confidence and reduce cognitive anxiety. It suggested that increases in self-confidence can be regarded as a viable function explaining the facilitating effects of self-talk on performance. Or in other words, uh, the way you talk about yourself affects the way you perform. Uh, so you should develop a self-talk routine. Every day, spend a few minutes talking yourself up. It's helpful to write this down and to say it out loud. I would do this alongside your journal of accomplishments. Many people think this is silly and weird, and it might be, but it's proven to work uh, in many, many, many um, scientific uh, surveys uh, or studies, and I'll talk more about this later. Uh, ninth and finally in this section, do it anyway. Do it anyway. People struggling with a lack of confidence sometimes use that as an excuse not to try, but you don't need to be confident to compete. Adam Grant, the Wharton organizational psychologist, says you don't need to build confidence to achieve challenging goals. You build confidence through achieving challenging goals. Confidence is more the result of progress than the cause of it. And I think to some extent that is true. There is a feedback loop in the, in the self-confidence struggle where you don't have confidence and so then you don't feel like you can do it and so then you don't do it and so then that proves that you shouldn't have had confidence in the first place, uh, which then makes you feel even worse about yourself, which means you perform worse, which is further proof that you're not capable of doing it. At some point, you just have to break the cycle and you just have to, to do it. And then once you do it, you have to, be, uh, con you have to, you have to learn confidence from the fact that you were able to do it. Uh, even if you weren't able to win, the, fact that, the mere fact that you were able to try is an accomplishment in itself, and you just start quit, kind of building your resume of accomplishments to boost your uh, competitiveness. So the next two sections are going to have a lot of information that can help you build confidence, because a lot of confidence goes into uh, your performance anxiety, and a lot of it has to do with how you manage failure. So uh, all of that is also going to be relevant to um, the, what I've just discussed. So Roman numeral two, or section two, managing competitive anxiety. Managing competitive anxiety. The first point, performance anxiety. What is it? Uh, Christopher Arneson, who is a professional voice trainer and singing coach, um, has a, wrote an interesting article about applying some of this stuff to singing, just as I'm applying it to debate. I mean, I thought it was the best summary of this that I've read. So here's what he says. He says, performance anxiety is a universal human experience that occurs with varying intensity in everyone. Uh, the anxiety generated stems from the emergence of certain key developmental experiences, and these experiences can lead to a level of stress and anxiety that is unprecedented. The key challenge is to figure out what is going on within you by consciously monitoring and taking mental notes of all the signals your performance anxiety is sending you. With this approach, performance anxiety takes on a quality of enticement for learning, 
That is, it will give you indicators for potential and for possibilities of learning about yourself as a performer and a person. You, go, you all kind of intuitively understand performance anxiety. It's, those, it's the nerves you get for a debate. It's the feeling in your stomach, the butterflies. It's the tension in your chest. It's the shortness of breath. It's the, the hyper-awareness. It's that kind of veil that you get. It's, it's almost like a headache, but you just, you're feeling really amped up and really nervous. And it manifests in different physical ways from person to person, but we all kind of know what that means. Even before giving a, a lecture like this, I get a little bit of that. Um, I'm sure before you give a practice speech uh, in front of your lab, before you do a practice debate, before a first round of a tournament, before an elimination round of a tournament, uh, you get that, you just get that, that anxious feeling. Uh, and you're not free. You're not able to just, just be and do what you know you can do. There's, there's something stopping you. Um, and that's what this section is about. Point number two, choking. What is it? What is choking? Jonathan Vader says, choking is a drastic decline in performance in any high stress situation. It's when an athlete becomes overly concerned with the outcome that they switch off their mental autopilot. For the non-athletes reading, recall the last time you drove a car. Chances are you weren't concerned with the precise angle of the steering wheel, your exact alignment in the lane, or nervously trying to anticipate what the car in front of you was trying to do. But at one point in driver's ed class, you did. You jerked the car around, erratically braked, and were bad. In the vast majority of performances, from throwing a baseball to driving a car, there's a direct correlation in our ability to not think and our ability to perform well. Choking is what happens when you forget to stop thinking and start crumbling under pressure. Some of you probably have not driven yet. Some of you have uh, only have experience with the driver's ed portion of that where you're terrible at driving. Uh, but you can probably find other examples. Uh, Fader is describing this in the context of athletic performance or physical performance, but it's also true in debate. Obviously, you don't want to stop thinking in debate, but you want to stop thinking about anything but the argument. Stop thinking about anything but the process of debating. You want to be debating free and clear in the zone, in that kind of zone of intensity where you're not thinking about anything else, you're not thinking about the outcome, you're not thinking about the context, you're not doubting yourself, you're not thinking about what my record's going to be and what are people thinking about this and what is going to happen in the next round and if we win this round, what is that? Are we going to clear and are we going to get our TOC bid and are we going to make our coach proud? You're not thinking about any of that. You just stop thinking and you just perform. You just do it the way that you know you can. Choking is when you perform terribly because you're unable to do that. It's when you uh, collapse, uh, when, you, when you perform worse than you are capable of because of the pressure. Point number three, you can improve. You can improve. Uh, Cyan Bylock, I think is how you pronounce that, is now the president of Barnard College, um, but she uh, is, and currently still is, the director of the Human Performance Lab at the University of Chicago, which does a ton of really interesting research about this subject. She wrote a book called Choke that uh, uh, was one of the first books that I read about this subject, and I think is still considered um, one of the preeminent texts in the field. Um, she did that work while she was a PhD uh, student at uh, Michigan State University. She says, you don't come into this world a choker versus a non-choker. Performing under pressure is something you learn. I am sure there are exceptional world-class athletes that break records in practice, but being able to put that best foot forward when it matters most is what really separates those whom we talk about from those maybe we don't. I think we can learn how to do this. There is a toolbox of techniques that we can all employ in whatever we are doing so that we can shine when all eyes are on us. And that's an important under uh, realization. Uh, some people crumble under pressure, but that doesn't mean they always will, and that doesn't mean that they can't stop crumbling under pressure. That doesn't mean that they can't train to eliminate that tendency. It doesn't mean that they can't learn to be clutch. Clutch is kind of the opposite of choking. A clutch performer uh, performs when the pressure is on. They do their best in all circumstances, especially the, the circumstances when the pressure is high. Uh, someone who chokes does not, and you can fix that. So uh, the, uh, the rest of this section, and we'll, I'll continue with the same numbering, uh, but there's going to be some that are about before the tournament, so kind of at home, and then I will tell you when we're starting to transition, in, transition into suggestions at the tournament. So the before the tournament um, tips begin now. So point number four. Focus on the process, not the outcome. Focus on the process, not the outcome. John Wooden, in one of, one of my favorite quotes, kind of his coaching philosophy, says, competitiveness must be focused exclusively on the process of what you are doing rather than the result of that effort, the so-called winning or losing. Otherwise, you may lose self-control and become tight emotionally, mentally, and physically. I think someone who is too competitive as an individual is overly worried about the final score. Therefore, I never mention winning or victory to my players. I never refer to beating an opponent. Instead, I constantly urge them to strive for the self-satisfaction that always comes from knowing you did the best you could to become the best of which you are capable. That's what I wanted, the total effort. That was the measurement I used, never the final score. And for those that would say, oh, well, you gotta, you gotta, winning is everything. You know, it's, winning uh, is, is the goal of everything, and if, you, if, you, if you're not trying to win, you're not going to win. Well, uh, tell that to John Wooden, the coach of 10 uh, national champions. Lauren Abarca, who's the uh, mental conditioning coach with the Yankees, says, no matter how much you practice, plan, or think positively, it doesn't eliminate the chance of failure. 
That's why the outcome is not a reliable reflection of performance. Commit to doing the right things right now and make executing your process the new definition of success. If you can learn to think about debate this way, you will be amazed at how much less performance anxiety and competitive anxiety you have. Because you, you have control over your process. You have control over how you debate. The thing you can never have control over is whether or not you win. Whether or not you win the debate, whether or not you win the tournament, whether or not you satisfy the expectations of others, whether or not you uh, achieve whatever the, the long-term goal you have is. The only thing you can control is how you're debating in this particular round. The only thing you can control is how you are preparing for the tournament. That's what you can control. You'll also learn more if you think about things this way. Abarka says, your results tell you if something works. Your process tells you why it did or didn't. When we become too outcome focused, we lose out on the benefits of learning why. Uh, process focus also allows you to play loose. It allows you to debate uh, loose, carefree, like you don't care and have nothing to lose. Like it's just fun and you're just doing this to test yourself and to see how good you are. Uh, Jonathan Bader says, I often tell athletes to separate the process from the outcome. The more we fixate on the outcome, whether or not a play was executed properly, whether or not the other team is ahead or not, the more likely we are to choke up. Athletes need to both play as if they don't care about the outcome while simultaneously giving the game their all. While simultaneously giving their game their all. It's kind of an interesting way to think about it. You have to not care at all about the outcome, but care relentlessly and intensely about how you are competing. Because that is the thing that you can control. That also helps you maintain perspective, and maintaining perspective is essential to avoid choking. Shane McGowan, who's the founder of a, a, a consultancy called Mental Edge Performance, says the big game for the championship is the same game as you played all regular season. By labeling it the big game, the importance increases and you feel more pressure and this can affect your performance. The best way to approach championship games is to stick to what you have done all season long. You need to prepare for championship moments all season. Practice championship scenarios and imagine those moments so when you're in those situations, you feel like you have been there before. Most of the worst uh, chokes I've, I've ever seen in debate uh, have been in TOC bid rounds or championship rounds. And it's because students forget about the process and are so worried about the outcome that they get in their own way and they debate worse than they've debated in years. So if your big goal is I'm going to get a TOC bid and you, you make the TOC bid round a bigger deal than all of your other rounds, it is inevitable that you will perform worse than if you just took it like any other round and focused on the process. If you're really focused on winning a tournament, and you get to that final round, and the final round means everything, and this is, this is it, this is, this is for all the marbles, this is what I've been waiting for, this is such a big deal, I can't wait to get the trophy, I, I, I don't want to let my coach down, this is so important, you're not going to debate as well as you would if you just focus on the process. It's silly, and it's self-defeating, and it's dumb, because it is choosing to allow things that you can't control to ruin the things that you can. And so, focus on the process, not the outcome. Number five, practice the pressure. Practice the pressure. You want to simulate a hostile, tournament-like environment that gets your heart rate up and that simulates some of the consequences of poor performance. Bylock says it happens very subtly, but understanding how your body is going to feel under pressure and learning to handle it is a skill in yourself, in itself. So experience at performing under pressure helps you perform better when you have pressure at a tournament situation. So even a little bit of pressure, doing that uh, speech in front of others, uh, giving yourself less prep time, um, putting yourself out there and, and limiting your whatever the activity is, like making it harder, uh, doing something to make the activity more challenging, less speech time, or uh, you can't read a certain number of cards, or whatever, give the other team more speech time. Make it harder, make it more challenging, and create some stakes. Make little bets on the outcome of this. Uh, force yourself to embarrass yourself in front of others. If your big deal is that you're scared that you're going to look bad in front of others, practice looking bad in front of others on purpose. That's the only way to break this down. You can uh, say hello to people, uh, strangers, because you're scared of that. And just doing that can help you get better in debate. You can dress weird and just sit somewhere in public. There's a, my high school um, AP psychology teacher assigned this uh, thing where um, he made us uh, dress like homeless people and sit in front of stores and just experience what that's like. And it was embarrassing and it was uh, eye-opening and I still remember it. I sat outside a Blockbuster video, which tells you how old I am. You don't even know what that is. You used to have to go rent VHS tapes to watch a video. There was no Netflix, okay? Uh, and I dressed de de decrepitly and uh, just interacting with people the, the way they would treat you. Some were nice, some were terrible. Um, but just, like, that was so, I'm anxious about everything and that was so anxiety-inducing. But I still remember it because it was such a formu uh, formulative experience. And you just want to convince yourself that it's not that big of a deal if you look bad. It's not that big of a deal if you embarrass yourself. Embarrassing yourself is not that big of a deal. And so if that's your big hang-up, practice it. 
Uh, the goal is for you to be able to perform under pressure as if the pressure is always there. There's no difference between pressure and non-pressure. Tim Grover, uh, Michael Jordan's coach, says when you're good, you can shine under the bright lights. When you're great, you don't even notice the lights. Um, and then he's got another quote that I love. There is no beast mode. There are just beasts, and they're like that all the time. If you have to shift into a different mode, you're already behind. Another technique that I suggest is to utilize uh, meditation. There's an app that I really like called Headspace. There are other apps that are competitors to it. Um, but incorporating uh, meditation into your life is valuable uh, regardless of debate. But it's also incredibly helpful at uh, priming you to handle pressure in competitive environments. And I'm not going to go into a long thing about that, um, but do do consider looking into that. Read some uh, read some information about the role of meditation in, in athletic competition um, and the use of uh, meditation uh, to uh, overcome anxiety. Um, on Headspace, if you subscribe to it, there are a lot of uh, lessons uh, or series uh, within Headspace that are entirely focused on training for competition. And I think that you'll find um, them incredibly powerful in helping you overcome your anxiety. All right, so now we're going to move on to, to things that are more at the tournament. So number six. Uh, this could be before or after, is visualize success. Visualize success. You need to visualize and practice winning. Or as Sua says, visualize yourself succeed and align your daily actions with that vision. The story I like to tell about this one, or the anecdote, um, is, uh, is, is it's awesome. It's, it's really one of my favorites. Uh, Jim Valvano was a basketball coach. He's now passed uh, from cancer, very sad, um, at a way too young age. Um, but he was the basketball coach, men's basketball coach at North Carolina State University, which was not a basketball powerhouse when he got there. It was terrible. I think of whatever one of these terrible basketball teams is now, they were that bad. But uh, from, the, from the first time that he got there, the first thing that they did on the first day of practice when he took over the team is they got out a ladder and they set it underneath the hoop and they practiced climbing the ladder and cutting down the nets. And that's what the, the winner of the NCAA tournament uh, does when they win the championship. They get a ladder and then each player uh, climbs the ladder and gets a scissors and cuts one of the uh, little things that hangs the net from the basket. And then eventually they cut down the net and that is like symbolic of you have won the, you've won the tournament, you've won the national championship. Every team does that, okay? Now there was no chance that North Carolina State, when Jim Balbano got to North Carolina State, was going to win the national championship. They were not going to be cutting down any nets. But he made them practice that every single day because he wanted to change the player's perspective from that's not something we could ever do to no, that is something we can do. I'm going to climb the net, I'm going to climb the ladder, and I'm going to cut down the net. And in one of the most uh, incredible NCAA tournaments ever, a couple of years later, North Carolina State won the national championship in one of the, the biggest upsets of, in sports history. Um, the version of that for debate is to visualize the room that you're going to be in, visualize the speeches you're going to be in, the giving, visualize the, the feeling that you're going to have before the debate, uh, during the debate, during the decision time, waiting for the decision, the feeling you're going to get when the decision is announced. Just think about all of that. Um, when, when I first got to Woodward and I was kind of trying to change the team culture, one of the things that I would do, because uh, we had some teams, and we, I guess when I first got there we were good, but then we were bad, uh, and we were rebuilding. So one of the first things that I did is I would take, uh, when we would get to a tournament, I would take our you know, top couple teams that we, were, we had at the tournament, we would uh, go to the hotel and we would go to the ballrooms where the elimination rounds were going to be held. And I would make them sit in the tables where you would be sitting if you were competing in those elimination rounds. And I would force them to imagine what it would be like to debate in this room. And they would sit there and they would visualize and I would prompt them and we would talk about what it would be like to debate in front of uh, an audience and in this kind of room with these acoustics and this is what it looks like. And we would do that every time. Even if realistically they were going to go two and four at the tournament and there was no chance they were going to clear, we would do it anyway. Uh, you should do that. You should do that physically, and you should do that visually or whatever, like in your hat, idea-wise. Um, think about what it's going to look like. Constantly be rehearsing. Um, Andrew Arsht, uh, who was a great debater at Georgetown University, um, taught with us at HSS for several years. Um, and we'd often we'd talk about miscellaneous things. But one of the things that I always really enjoyed um, was like, if you could only give one tip about debate, what would it be? And he's a, an odd guy. And, uh, so he came up with one of the, the cleverest ones I've ever heard, and it still sticks with me. And he said, every time you take a shower, think about debate. And uh, I was like, really? And I thought about it, and that's pretty, that's great. That is a great tidbit. Uh, I don't know how long, you know, the average shower is five minutes or ten minutes or whatever, but if you take those five or ten minutes and you visualize uh, tournaments and you, you visualize success and you just think about debate and you think about, uh, you know, the, the, the drive that you have to succeed and you think about what you're going to do and you think about arguments and you play debates through in your head, if you just do that every day, it's unbelievable how much time you're going to be spending just visualizing debate. It's not like you're going to do anything else at that time. Um, so uh, find a time, whether in the shower or not, that's not the, the shower's not the point, uh, to just do the visualizations over and over again every day. You'll be amazed at how much it, it helps. Um, you'll be cutting down the nets in no time. Number seven, acknowledge your feelings. Acknowledge your feelings. There's a saying that I really like called, I can't, or it, that is, I can't stop the waves, but I can learn to surf. 
Uh, and that's kind of what you need to do. You can't suppress your feelings. They're real. Uh, people who tell you to relax and calm down, uh, they're kind of assholes because if you could, you would, but you're not going to because you have these feelings. So shut up, person who says relax. Don't relax. Uh, relaxing is also just not the right approach. You want to feel the adrenaline rush. You want to feel excited and amped up to do your debate. So you have to begin by acknowledging your feelings. Darren Fenster, who's a minor league manager with the Boston Red Sox, one of the pioneers of incorporating mental skills training into baseball, uh, says excitement, nerves, anxiety, what you're feeling is normal. And what just about every single athlete in every sport has felt before. Embrace it. Talk about it with coaches. Work through it with teammates. You'll help one another far more together than you will, than you will yourself alone. One of the best ways to do this is to write down your feelings, uh, either on paper or in a document. Just You can even delete them afterward, but just dump your concerns. Dump your fears. Dump the feelings of uh, unconfidence and, and pressure and, uh, and upsetness and, and being scared, all of that. Uh, Susanna Locke in Vox is summarizing, has a good summary of Bylock's um, talk about this, uh, and it says, express your emotions before you start. Bylock's research group has shown that writing about one's feelings before a test can help. In a study published in Science, they explored this by having college students take a very difficult math exam. To boost the pressure, the researchers put some cash on the line and videotaped the subjects, telling them the tape would be shown to their teachers and friends. And they had some people write down their concerns. Uh, and their fears and the other people didn't. And they found that the people who wrote down their concerns, I'm very scared, this is very intimidating, I'm, I'm very anxious, I have butterflies, I have shortness of breath, this is, this is really hard, I don't think I'm gonna be able to do it. Those people did better. And it's because you've gotten that out of your head and you've, you've, you've just sort of, you've spit it out. You, you've stopped internalizing it, you've stopped keeping it in. And you've, you've put it down and you've, you've said it, you've just acknowledged it. And the acknowledgement is powerful. Point eight is keep your feelings in perspective. Keep your feelings in perspective. An important thing to remember is that your feelings don't define you. They're just your feelings. And so you don't have to believe them, and you don't have to respond to them in any particular way. Justin Sua says, no matter how prepared you are, you may still feel scared, nervous, lost, tired, intimidated, or uncertain. Don't use these feelings as an excuse to not give your best or interpret them as a sign you won't perform well. Lean into discomfort and trust your training. The uh, Pittsburgh Pirates director of mental strength named Bernie Holiday um, puts it a slightly different way. We can perform at high levels while experiencing worry, anxiety, fear, and negative thinking. Things become more difficult when we worry about being worried, become anxious that we're anxious, feel afraid to feel afraid, and think negatively about our negative thinking. Lean in. Uh, just kind of getting out your feelings, saying what they are, acknowledging them, and then understanding that those aren't your destiny and that there's no particular way that you need to react to those is a powerful way uh, to, to uh, get rid of some of those feelings or to redirect them, which is going to be the next point. Last point under this, or last, uh, last quote, uh, is from Lauren Barca, the Yankees coach. Don't be fooled. You don't have to feel good to play good. You don't have to feel confident to look confident. You don't have to feel ready to be ready. You don't have to feel great to have a great performance. Focus on actions, not feelings. So just remind yourself. It's the action that matters. It's not my feeling. I can do well when I'm feeling stressed. I can do well when I'm feeling scared. Point number nine, reframe your feelings. Reframe your feelings. Abarca says, the story you tell yourself about how you feel affects what you do. And Pat Summit, who coached eight NCAA women's national, uh, basketball national champions and also received the Presidential Medal of Freedom, says, attitude is a choice. What you think you can do, whether positive or negative, confident or scared, will most likely happen. And it turns out that this is borne out by research. Uh, there's a mental skills coach uh, named Kerry Cheadle who wrote a book called On Top of Your Game, Mental Skills in Maximizing Athletic Performance. Um, she published an, uh, a, the results of a study in the Journal of Experimental Psychology that showed that instead of trying to calm yourself down, reappraising performance anxiety as excitement is the way to go. When you try to suppress those nerves, you are inherently telling yourself something is wrong. Uh, this makes the situation worse. worse. It takes enormous emotional and physical energy to fight against feeling anxious. Giving certain sensations like butterflies in your stomach a negative label has a really bad trickle-down effect that can stifle performance. So instead, simply saying, I am excited, shifts your demeanor from a threat mindset, which is where you're stressed out and apprehensive, to an opportunity mindset, where you're revved up and ready to go. Uh, Cheadle says, compared to those who attempt to calm down, individuals who reappropriate their anxious arousal as excitement perform better. Or put differently, the sensations you feel prior to a big event are neutral. If you view them in a positive light, they are more likely to have a positive impact on your performance. Bylock says, for every negative thought that crosses our mind, it is essential that we lift ourselves up and remind ourselves in very specific terms of what we have accomplished. This goes back to your accomplishment journal. This is so important because when negative thoughts go unattended, we end up reallocating our mental resources to manage our fears 
rather than focusing on the task at hand. And so you need to learn to reframe the fear and the stress uh, that you're feeling as pressure, but then think of pressure as something good. Think of pressure as something awesome. It means you care. It means you're excited. Or as Bernie Holiday, the Pirates mental, uh, director of mental strength says, fear is not the enemy. It's a natural, healthy, and helpful response to something that one, we care about, and two, has an uncertain outcome. The real enemy is the fear of being afraid, which causes us to avoid, hesitate, second guess, and act timid. That's the true performance killer. It's not the fear, it's the reaction to the fear. Tim Grover puts it like this. If someone puts you in a pressure situation, it's because they believe you can handle it. Pressure is a privilege, rise up to it. He also helpfully dis kind of distinguishes between stress and pressure. He says pressure is not the same as stress. Pressure is a situation you can control. Stress is pressure you failed to control. Stop running from pressure, run to it, embrace it. Let it take you somewhere no one else would dare to go. Pressure makes you sharp, strong, resilient. It toughens your spirit and sharpens the blade. It's not easy. Does it have to be? Uh, and he says most people experience stress as a major negative. They can't get comfortable with the physical and mental disruption and they shut down. Successful competitors go the other way. They embrace it as pressure and they thrive on it. Pressure is a challenge, not a punishment. So by acknowledging your feelings, by understanding that they're, they're just feelings and that you don't have to act upon them, that actions are more important than feelings, and by then redefining the feelings that you're having as pressure, and that pressure is something you love, and something that you relish and cherish, it's a challenge, it's not a punishment, it's an opportunity, it's a privilege, it's not, a, it's not something uh, that you should run away from, but it's something you should run to, um, you'll be amazed at how much your mindset can improve before a debate. Number 10, use positive self-talk. I previewed this before, but self-talk is anything you say to yourself, whether in your head or out loud, uh, negative or positive. Positive self-talk, like, I can do this, I'm going to win, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do my best, uh, those types of things. Negative self-talk, I'm going to mess this up, I'm going to fail, this is going to be terrible, uh, this is overwhelming, I'm so stressed, stuff like that. Mastering self-talk is a big part of mental skills coaching in the sports world. Uh, star athletes like Michael Jordan and Tom Brady and Tiger Woods have written about uh, their work with sports psychologists to work on positive self-talk. Uh, and the reason they do that is because, uh, as Bilek says, thinking differently about how you can perform actually changes your performance. We talked about that before. There are many good studies about this. Um, one by Allison Wood Brooks at the Harvard Business School uh, says, her findings demonstrate the profound control and influence we have over our own emotions. The way we verbalize and think about our feelings helps to construct the way we actually feel. Saying, I'm excited, represents a simple, minimal intervention that can be used quickly and easily to prime an opportunity mindset and improve performance. This skill may be particularly helpful for managers and organizations to motivate their employees. For example, advising employees to say, I am excited before important performance tasks, or simply encourage them to get excited, may increase their confidence, improve performance, and boost beliefs in their ability to perform well in the future. Uh, another article in the Journal of Sport and Exercise Psychology uh, kind of tested this. They tested junior tennis players. Uh, and they said their observable self-talk gestures and match scores were recorded, uh, and they interviewed them. And the results suggest that self-talk influences competitive sport outcomes. The importance of believing in self-talk and the potential motivational and detrimental effects of negative self-talk and performance uh, are demonstrated. So players that talk themselves up won more. Players that talk themselves down or didn't talk to themselves did not win as much. Um, there's a literature review in the Journal of Organizational Behavior that says various bodies of literature, including clinical psychology, counseling psychology, sports psychology, education, and communication, all address the effect of self-talk and mental imagery on performance. This research provides consistent support for the relationship between constructive self-leadership of these cognitive processes and enhanced performance. Or otherwise, in other words, there are many studies that prove this. It's easy. You can have an affirmation statement. I've written one for um, the HSS. The HSS affirmation statement is, I am a hardworking, well-prepared debater. I treat my teammates, coaches, opponents, and judges with respect. I diligently prepare and organize my materials. I am confident in my knowledge of my arguments. I am prepared to communicate my arguments persuasively to a judge. I am ready to debate my best. I am proud of my hard work. I cherish every opportunity to debate. I want to be the best version of myself. Saying that before you go to a debate, making that part of your pre-round routine, can have a significant impact on how well you perform. You can also just do shorter things. It doesn't have to be a full uh, uh, affirmation. I am prepared for this speech. I am excited to deliver it. It will be an excellent speech. If you say that to yourself, type it out or say it out loud if no one's around, or just say it in your head, uh, it will help you perform better. Many debaters do the opposite. They stand up for a speech and they say, this is going to be terrible. Uh, this is going to be awful. Oh, God. Oh, oh, oh dear. Uh, that is a self-fulfilling prophecy. It makes the speech worse. This also will help you reframe negative comments into positive ones. So don't say, uh, we have to make sure we don't drop anything. We want to say, we have to intelligently allocate time so we can answer all of their arguments. Don't say, uh, 
don't mess up in this debate. Say, have a great debate. Um, don't say, mistake-free debating. Say, have fun. This is a great opportunity to debate. Uh, and little things like that can, have a, can make a powerful difference. One thing that's kind of always embedded in this is gratitude. Having a little statement of gratitude for the opportunity to have this competition, to, to feel this pressure, can be very powerful. Josh Lifrek, who's the director of the mental skills program for the Chicago Cubs, says a lot of times we get so focused on what we're doing, we forget how truly lucky we are to be doing it. Remember to take a moment today and appreciate what opportunities are available for you. Number 11, use self-distancing. Use self-distancing. Talk to yourself like you talk to others. There's a really interesting article in the Journal of Personality and Social, Social Psychology that evaluates why LeBron James, the NBA superstar, when he was making the decision, uh, when he decided to leave the Cleveland Cavaliers and sign with the Miami Heat, um, when he gave that statement, why did he use the third person? So uh, he, uh, shortly after making his choice, uh, he described his decision-making process in an, in an interview noting, quote, one thing I didn't want to do was make an emotional decision. I wanted to do what's best for LeBron James and to do what makes LeBron James happy. Uh, and the authors noticed, why is he referring to himself as I, but then it changes to LeBron James and he talks about himself in the third person. Is that a mere quirk of speech or does it represent something more? So they studied it. Uh, and their hypothesis was that using one's own name and other non-first person pronouns to refer to the self during introspection is a form of self-distancing that enhances self-regulation. So they did the study and they were right. Self-talk is a ubiquitous human phenomenon. We all have an internal monologue that we engage in from time to time. The current research demonstrates that small shifts in the language people use to refer to the self as they engage in this process consequentially influences their ability to regulate their thoughts, feelings, and behavior under social stress, even for people who are dispositionally vulnerable to social anxiety. So in other words, by talking about yourself in the third person, you change your perspective and you change the impact that your self-talk has on your psyche and your preparedness to perform. So by saying, uh, if I, uh, Bill Batterman is going to give an excellent lecture this morning, that is better and more impactful than saying, I am going to give a better lecture this morning. Uh, same thing when you acknowledge your fears. If you say, I am afraid that I'm going to fail, if you say Bill Batterman is afraid that he's going to fail, but Bill Batterman is not, he shouldn't be, because Bill Batterman is prepared for this lecture. Bill Batterman has put in the time to be ready. Bill Batterman has done successful lectures before, and so Bill Batterman is ready to give an excellent lecture now. By doing that, it's weird, but it works, and it's proven to work because it changes the way uh, you think about the situation. The other way to think about it is, uh, imagine how you would handle uh, talking to a friend who was telling you about this same problem. So if a friend came to you and said, I'm really worried about this debate, you wouldn't be like, yeah, you're right, because you suck, you, you're terrible, you're probably gonna fail, this is gonna be terrible. You would say, no, 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 you're great, you should be really confident in this speech, you're gonna do great, I've seen you give good speeches before, I know how prepared you are, I know how hard you've worked, you're gonna be great, I, I'm proud of you, I'm proud of you anyway, it, just, just have fun, right, that's what you would say. You have to figure out how to say that to yourself and treat yourself with the same respect and dignity that you treat other people. Don't be an asshole to yourself. That's the kind of negative self-talk that ruins your performance. Number 12, breathe. Breathe. Uh, breathing is important, so important. Uh, and uh, there's a, there are a couple techniques for breathing that can help you calm down in uh, uh, high uh, stress situations. There's something called resonant breathing or coherent breathing and something that's uh, trademarked by someone. It's a form of breathing that involves taking long, slow breaths, uh, about five per minute. And it helps the body calm uh, itself through a bunch of uh, stuff about the nervous system that uh, is not worth explaining. But it, it scientifically demonstrated, and it, it makes sense. There's like an intuitive explanation about different nerves and the way that uh, your, your auto, uh, autonomic nerve system works. A key benefit is that you can do it anywhere. So right before a debate, develop a breathing routine. You've got to practice it before you get it. But you want to get uh, into the habit of taking regular breaths in and out of the nose at, a, at about five per minute. Uh, which translates into a count of about six, which is one per second for in inhaling and exhaling. You can search for this, so search for resonant breathing or coherent breathing, and there's lots of little tutorials. Um, there's some websites that have little timer things with beepers that'll help you um, practice it. It's kind of hard at first because you have to breathe much more slowly than you normally would, and then you have to exhale much more slowly than you normally would. Um, at first, I, I found it helpful, and a lot of people say, uh, do it with your eyes closed. But once you get it, you just know it, and it's like intuitive, and you don't have to think about it anymore. Um, and so when you find yourself anxious or stressed, uh, you can just sit there and do a couple of rounds. It's totally private. Nobody knows you're doing it. Um, there's a person called Patricia Gerbarg, who's a, at, a psychiatry professor at New York Medical College. She writes a lot about this. Um, but it's amazing. They've demonstrated that this helps with depression. It helps with anxiety. It helps with uh, PTSD. It helps with all of these more, much more serious conditions than just pre-round competitive stress. Um, so learn how to, how to uh, resonantly breathe uh, to just kind of center yourself as part of your pre-round uh, activity. Number 13 is clench your fist. This one's easy. Um, Denise Mann summarizes some research from the Journal of Experimental Psychology. Uh, researchers figured out that athletes can help keep their cool under pressure by uh, clenching the fist of their left hand. So the way I would suggest doing it is 
uh, take your, uh, your middle finger and your ring finger and just push into the middle of your palm. No one needs to see you do this. I'm doing it right now and you would have no idea I'm doing it unless I go like, look what I'm doing. Uh, this sort of works, but the key is you wanna put pressure here, right in the middle uh, on, on, on the nerves and make sure that you're feeling it. You know, it's not light, it's like you're, you're feeling it. Um, you can also do it with like a stress ball or one of those little, you know, those little things, uh, fidget ball things. Uh, just hold it tight. And what they found is that the left side of your body is controlled by the right side of your brain. Obviously, they didn't find that. They knew that. And increasing activation in the right hemisphere decreases activation in the left hemisphere. And choking under pressure seems to be caused by dominant activation in the left hemisphere, which controls the areas of the brain that help us psych ourselves out when under the gun. So this side is the one that's going to try to mess you up and, and cause you to be thinking about everything except what you're doing. This side is going to just let you do your thing. And so by doing this, you're making this side be like, wake up and take control, uh, and it calms you down. And this, I thought this was complete nonsense, and so I looked for proof that this was complete nonsense, but it seems like it works. Um, there were three studies in that uh, thing, uh, that study involving soccer players, judo experts, and badminton players, um, and the results were very good, and then other people have kind of demonstrated the same kind of thing. The other thing is that it doesn't really matter if it actually works, if you believe it works, and so it probably has some effect, but it also has a placebo effect, and it doesn't matter. Uh, the placebo effect can still be as real as the, as the actual effect. So just do this. So you do your resonant breathing, and you just do this. Nobody has to know that you're doing anything weird. Nobody's going to notice you. They're all in their own world. Number 14, and on the same note, change your body language. Sua says, people can't read your mind, but they can read your body language. Always carry yourself like a champion. Um, and the kind of specific thing that you can do is something that uh, Carrie Cheadle uh, describes. Um, and it's based on uh, Amy Cuddy, who's a Harvard psychologist. She had a TED talk about the power posing position. Um, but what you want to do when you're feeling stressed is you want to get into a power position. So you spread your feet, uh, kind of shoulder width apart, keep your shoulders back, and you just kind of try to make yourself big and out there. You're like feel, looking confident. And even if you're not confident, that changes the body chemistry uh, and it sends you certain endorphins or whatever. I don't totally understand the process, but again, this is repeatedly demonstrated by studies. This gives you more confidence. The other thing you should do while you're doing that is smile. Smiling is like a legal performance enhancing drug because when you smile, you get a rush of endorphins that help calm you down and make you feel good. And so the combination of resonant breathing, doing this, power posing, and smiling is like an awesome way to just fix some of the body chemistry stuff that's going awry when you're getting really stressed. You'll be amazed at how much you can calm yourself down. Number 15, develop and follow routines. Uh, I love this one. Lauren Abarca, the Yankees coach, says routines are like the eye of a hurricane. It's the space between what just happened and what's about to happen. Giving, yourself a, giving you a moment to yourself to turn the page, to reset, and prepare for what's next. The reason that they are so effective is because they, they create a sense of comfort and control in a hostile situation. So Carrie Cheadle says, uh, having a pre-planned series of actions gives you something to focus on so your mind can't wander and become anxious. If you're just doing your routine, it's something comfortable and you're not thinking about anything else because it's, it's allowing you to direct all that nervous energy into something productive. Uh, there was a study in the European Journal of Sports Science that found that consistently practicing pre-performance routines reduced anxiety and increased performance among athletes. The elements of the routine itself don't really matter, Cheadle says. What does matter is that you design a series of steps that make you feel good and that you practice it enough so that it becomes comfortable for you. Uh, LeBron James has an awesome uh, pre-game ritual. He forms the numbers 330 with his fingers after the national anthem. That's Akron's area code, his hometown. Uh, he gives a unique handshake or fist bump to every one of his teammates uh, in the same sequence every time. He asks the referee to hand him the game ball so he can give it a light massage and then hands it back. And then he goes to the scorer's table, gets some chalk, and does this thing where he makes the chalk uh, go into the air. And he does the exact same thing between every game. Now, that is not the reason that LeBron James is good at basketball. If I did that, I would still suck at basketball. Uh, it would be comical, right? But the reason he does that is because that ritual helps him feel ready. It helps him deal with the nerves. Even LeBron James has nerves before uh, big basketball games. The idea that he doesn't is wrong. You, you can read about it. He's been very open about um, the nerves and the anxiety and the, and the doubts and stuff that he has. He works heavily with mental skills coaches and sports psychologists. So develop a little pre-round ritual. Um, incorporate some lucky thing, a little uh, superstition. It can't be too extreme so that you'll like have a breakdown if you forget it or whatever, but having a lucky pen or a lucky pin or a little lucky thing that you keep in your backpack and set on the table when you're debating, um, something like that, uh, makes you feel better. 
because it's something that you can control. You're taking something you can't control, win or lose, and finding something you can't control. I can't control what I win, but I've got my little figurine that I put on my desk when I'm debating. I don't have to tell anyone about it. It can be private. I can just touch it in my backpack so no one can even see, so that you don't have to feel embarrassed. Um, but have a little lucky thing, a little superstition. Uh, say your mantra. That's positive self-talk, but incorporate that into your routine. A short one or a long one. Uh, have a psych-up playlist. Um, there's uh, two British sports psychologists uh, did a study, and they said, in a sense, music can be thought of as a type of legal performance-enhancing drug. Uh, the key to a motivational track is that it physically energizes, stimulates, and activates. A piece of music can do this on many different levels. It has to do with tempo or speed. It might have to do with rhythm or accentuation or melody and lyrical content. Music may also be motivational through a process of classical conditioning, so that a piece of music is associated with motivational imagery. One of the best examples that they cite, and that I would imagine you can come up with, is the music from Rocky. When people hear the Rocky soundtrack, it, they remember the motivational training montage, and that arouses them and energizes them, and you like feel like you want to run through a wall or punch somebody. Um, some people want music that is more arousing, and some people want music that is more calming, but the key is to find something that makes you feel good. Find one song that you'll play before every debate. Uh, you can even listen to a small part before every speech, just the last 10 seconds of your prep time. Put in your headphones and listen to a little thing. Think of it like walk-up music. When Major League Baseball players go up to the plate to bat, they all get to pick at home, they get to pick a song. And it's just a short little clip, 10 seconds, but hearing that song is like, all right, I heard my song, that song, for whatever reason, it makes me feel comfortable, and now I'm ready to hit. Same thing for a debate, but at least do one before a debate. And the essential important thing that I've learned from reading about this is you should never listen to that song at any other time. So you have to find it. It can't be your favorite song. It can't be like a song that's on your playlist. It has to be your walk-up song. And your walk-up song is only played right before the debate. And that will classically condition you that when you hear that music, it's go time. You're focused, you're comfortable, you're ready to rock and roll, and give an awesome speech. And so play around with it and figure out uh, what kind of song you want. But never listen to that song at any other time. Number 16 is center yourself. Uh, center yourself, C-E-N-T-E-R. Centering is a pre-performance routine, so this can be part of your routine. This is something that I would do when I stand up to give my speech. Uh, at first, you have to practice it because it would take a long time. When you get it down, it just takes a couple seconds. It was designed in the 70s by Robert Nideffer, who's a really famous sports psychologist, and then uh, Dr. Don Green wrote a book that kind of incorporated it for Olympic uh, training. And what it does is it channels your nerves productively and it directs your focus even in extremely high stress situations. And once you do it, it's very quick and it's highly effective and it makes sure that you begin uh, your performance, which in your case is a debate speech, uh, with the right frame of mind. There's seven steps and they're, it's a, you have to do them in this order. It gets you progressively closer to uh, quiet, focus, and poise. So step number one is form your clear intention. Clear the jumble of thoughts by focusing on just a single aim, such as I'm going to convince this buyer to sign a contract. Just keep the goal positive. So I'm gonna give an excellent speech is what I would do. I'm going to give an excellent speech. Number two is pick a focal point. Aim your eyes at an unimportant distant point toward which you're later going to mentally fling excess energy, stress, and nervousness. I have done this and no one noticed. So there's a specific brick on the back wall that I've been looking at when I feel a little flustered. Uh, I can't describe which one it is, but I know which one it is. It has like a slight black part on the right side, and many of them do, but like I know which one it is. Uh, and right as I stand up, I'm going to give an excellent lecture, and then I find my spot, and I just look at it briefly. And then any time during this, I'm feeling stressed or anxious, I look at my spot. And just by looking at my, that's my safe spot, that little thing on the wall. No one's noticing I'm doing it, but I have recentered myself, and I, that thing helps me um, relax. Next thing is breathe mindfully. Breathe in through your nose and out through your mouth. So I'm going to give an excellent speech. I found my thought. <sighs> Deep breath. You'll, you'll be amazed if you find this uh, in profession, watching professional sports. So uh, there's been this thing now where when I watch a baseball game and they zoom in on the batter, I can't help but watch what they do. And almost every Major League Baseball hitter, when they're standing in the box, getting ready for the pitch, they do this. And that's like, it's amazing that they all do that. And the reason they do that is because it works. Just that breath, and clo you, closing your eyes is fine if you feel self-conscious, don't. But just closing your eyes and taking a quick breath, uh, a deep breath, has a positive physiological uh, effect. Number four is release muscle tension. Progressively relax your muscles. I do this. You didn't notice I was doing that, but I just do a little bit because I tend to carry my, my uh, stress up here because I use the computer and go like this. But I just do a little of that, just get rid of that. Maybe shake your, shake your foot a little. It's not like, woo, or whatever. It's just a little thing. Just notice the tension, all right, it's there. Then you find your center. That's point number five. That's a, it's about two inches below your navel, two inches below the surface of your belly. Obviously, my belly is larger than your belly, but the idea is it's like somewhere in here, like just kind of in the middle there. You just kind of feel it. And focusing on that spot for a second, 
uh, or a microsecond just kind of centers you and re reminds you that you have a body and that you are physically present. So just think about that little spot right there. Then repeat your process cue. I'm going to give a great speech. That's number six. And then number seven is get rid, of, get rid of any excess energy by giving it back to your spot. So I can do this whole thing really quickly. So I will demonstrate. I'm, I'll say out loud what I would not say out loud. I'm going to give an excellent speech. I'm going to give an excellent speech. Go. And I do it. Okay. So no one would even notice that you're doing this, um, but it's incredibly powerful. Uh, and it, it works. Um, Don Green's book, if you want to check it out, is called Fight Your Fear and Win. Um, and he goes into more depth about this. But you can also just do a search for centering. And you can find lots of little drills to make you better at it. Number 17 and finally, choose your audience. If you can, connect with a specific judge, whether it is the judge or on a panel, pick one. Uh, or pick a couple that you're going to bounce back and forth to. But I, I find that stressful. I could never do that. I don't like looking at any of you. You've noticed I'm sort of pretending that I'm looking at you, but I haven't really looked at any of you. I'm still looking at my spot most of the time, and I'm just kind of like, I'm over the top over there. I'm like, I'm over there. You can't tell that I'm not looking at you, but I'm, I'm looking at different things. And so what I suggest you do is you should create an imaginary judge, someone that you feel comfortable with, someone who you trust and who you feel safe competing in front of, someone who you don't think is going to judge you, someone who makes you feel okay about yourself, someone who you like and appreciate. And you should pretend that they are sitting uh, in the general vicinity of the judge uh, so that you don't have to make eye contact with the judge. You can pretend that you're making eye contact with your imaginary judge. The judge will not notice, but you will feel much more comfortable. So a lot of you get intimidated to debate in front of certain judges or you just, uh, they're new people and so you, they're strangers. It's just scary to have to put yourself out there in front of a stranger. So pretend you're not. Pretend you're debating to someone else. Uh, Speak to your imaginary judge. Reassure yourself. I know that this imaginary judge that I'm speaking to is not going to judge me uh, harshly or you know, be mean to me, be cruel. And so I'm going to be comfortable debating in front of them. And then get tunnel vision where you're, you're, you don't even think about anyone else. Uh, I have not noticed any of the faces in here. I just realized a couple of you are in here who I know and I didn't notice that you were in here because I'm focused on my spot when I need to get rid of my excess energy and I'm focused on my imaginary person that I'm giving this lecture to um, who is uh, no one that you need to know about. Okay. Uh, Roman numeral three, coping with adversity and failure. Coping with adversity and failure. Point number one is to maintain perspective. James Clear, um, who has written a bunch of books about uh, habits and decision making and things like that, uh, says the difficult balance all competitors face, when the competition begins, zoom in and act as if this moment is the only thing that matters in the world. After the competition ends, zoom out, regain perspective, and realize your craft does not define you. That's hard. Uh, when you are debating, when you are competing, that has to be the thing you care more about than anything. You, you deeply care. You are relentlessly caring. You give it all. You, your complete effort. You leave everything on the field. You play to the whistle. This is, you are absorbed entirely into the process of doing the debate. But when the debate ends, you realize, that was just debate. That's not me. That's something I do. That doesn't define me. If I didn't win this debate or if I didn't debate well, that doesn't define who I am as a person. That's not my whole life. This is just a, a game that we play in high school. It's really fun, and it's really helpful, and it's really rewarding, um, and it's important. This doesn't mean that it's trivial, but it means that it's not your life, and you have to avoid the tendency to catastrophize and think that this is such an important thing. The related thing is you have to understand that everything is temporary, whether you win or lose. Uh, Lorna Barca says, the good news about failure is it's temporary. The bad news about success is that it's temporary. Don't allow yourself to ride the highs and lows of outcomes. Consistency lies in the process, not the result, returning to a previous thought. Uh, once you can convince yourself, and not, not just say that you believe this, but truly understand that success is not something you can ever guarantee, you can get a lot better at coping with failure. Abarca says elite athletes know that regardless of their effort, success is never guaranteed. Remember, wins and losses have one thing in common, they're temporary. There will always be a next opportunity. If you lose, don't be discouraged. If you win, don't be satisfied. And so the idea, and you, you've probably heard the, the just kind of more colloquial quote, you're never as good as when you're winning, you're never as bad as when you're losing, just kind of keep an even keel and smooth things out. Jake McKinley, who's a pitching coordinator at the Milwaukee Brewers, says, Milwaukee Brewers, uh, victory typically elevates joy and confidence, while defeat can lead to devastation and unease. Everyone goes through both, many times in streaks. The best overcome both. The victories don't go to their heads, but neither do the defeats. Just maintain perspective. Point number two, shed the ego. Shed the ego. A lot of people struggle because they think they've embarrassed themselves by failing. But as Harvey Martin, uh, who's the founder of the MindStrong Project and another uh, scout and coach with the Milwaukee Brewer, says, embarrassment comes with anything you dream of accomplishing. 
But when you can get past this and understand that it's part of growth and your journey, you'll be able to conquer anything. So to the extent that it's even embarrassment is even the right word, that's just something that is going to have to happen in order for you to grow and improve and reach your goals. Adam Grant says one of the main reasons people fall short of their potential is they care more, more about looking good than getting better. Excellence is the product of high aspirations and low ego. High aspirations and low ego. The other thing I always like to remind people is that we're all self-absorbed. Most people don't really notice. Uh, they're worried about themselves. Among those people who do notice or care, most of them will respect your effort and they will appreciate that you put yourself out there even if you fail. The few that will be really critical or that will be mean or jerks to you, who cares? They're assholes. Why do you want to give them control over your feelings? Why do you want to let them and what they think stop you from challenging yourself to continually improve? Why are you letting them control your life and your debate career? Uh, don't give them that power. And they don't have that power unless you give it to them. Abarka says, performing is the battle between what you fear the most and what you want the most. That is the epitome of expanding your comfort zone. If you want to get to that next level, this is the battle you should be seeking. And so when you're worried about, ah, that they're going to make fun of me, they're going to think less of me, you know, they're, I'm going to look bad in front of them. Just think, that's something you fear, but how does that compare to the thing you want? Do you want it more than you're afraid of that? If so, you just got to not care, and you just got to get over it. Point number three, embrace the suck. Embrace the suck. This is one of my favorite uh, little sayings or quotes. It's from Nicole Detling. She says, the most important play in life is always the next play. We might hate what just happened. It might have sucked. We might have looked like a complete moron out there, but you can't change that. So what I talk about is embrace the suck. So you take a minute and you say, well, that sucked, but you don't get stuck in the suck. What that means is you're focusing forward. The most important play is the next play. Not getting stuck in the suck means, okay, I can't change that now, but I can do something about it in the future. What's the next play? What am I gonna do on the next play? And if you can internalize that, and if you can make that your thing, one of your things, uh, you will be amazed at how much better you are. It's fine. Yeah, that sucked. You got it. Yeah, that was horrible. Oh, God. I looked terrible. I have, That was ugh, awful. Totally awful. All right. Now what? What do I do next? And learning to move on and, and, and getting over that previous failure is, is essential because otherwise you allow one failure to cascade. You then mess up the next time because you messed up the first time. So you sucked, and then you suck in the future because you're worried about sucking, and then you suck again because you were worried about sucking twice, and pretty soon you've got this horrible cascade effect where one mistake cascades and ruins your tournament or your semester or your season or your debate career or your life or whatever. Number four, distinguish between types of failures. Distinguish between types of failures. Sua says, uh, not all failures are created equal, and then he divides failures into three kinds. So point A is preventable failures. Those are a product of a lack of effort not adequately preparing, mental mistakes, not adhering to the established process or plan, mistakes that stem from lack of caring. Subpoint B are uncontrollable failures, failing because of unforeseen or unpredictable factors you couldn't prepare for, injury, poor officiating, coaches or bosses' decisions, equipment malfunction. You can think of parallels in debate, judge's decision, you know, something weird that happened, something that happened with the partner, something that happened with uh, the other team's uh, performance or whatever. Subpoint C are effective failures. Effective failures. That's where you give your absolute best and you still come up short. It's failing while you're performing at the edge of your ability. Uh, it's taking calculated risks and just coming up short. It's taking a shot and then coming up short. It's putting yourself out there and coming up short. He says all of these types of failures are painful and we can learn lessons from each one, but it's the failures we experience when we are pushing the limits that can help us maximize our potential. So if you fail, if you have a preventable failure, you are authorized to be dejected. That's, that's what Coach Wooden says. He says you're entitled to be dejected when you know you didn't do what you should have done in preparing yourself to execute near your own ability level. Yes, then you have reason to be dejected. But if you have prepared yourself properly, there is no reason to be downhearted. Disappointed, perhaps, but not excessively so. There is nothing to be ashamed of when you prepare to the best of your ability. But you have ample cause to be dejected when you know you didn't prepare properly when you had the ability to do so. Uh, Understanding the different types of failure will help you process better. It'll help you distinguish between failures where you should be disappointed in yourself because you didn't put in the effort and failures where you did the best you could, but you just came up short and now you got to learn from it. Sua says, what do you do when you know you're fully prepared and you give your best effort, but you still come up short? 
You get up and do it again, only better. Number five, reframe failure as feedback. Reframe failure as feedback. Abarca says, failure reveals what works by showing us what doesn't. When you view failure as feedback, we no longer fall victim to an emotionally charged response, but we become creators of a task-oriented to-do list. And I think that's an incredible way to think about it. Failure is feedback, and failure gives us a to-do list. Failure is not a statement about our capabilities. It is not condemning our character. It is not something we should be embarrassed or ashamed of. It is helpful feedback that then gives us a blueprint for going forward and being better. Adam Grant suggests a specific technique. He says, to avoid repeating past mistakes, run a post-mortem. That means debrief on what went wrong. To avoid making new mistakes, run a pre-mortem. Imagine a project has gone wrong and explain why. Anticipating reasons for failures can help prevent them. So think about how you're going to fail. Try to account for that. Then do it. Get some feedback. Create a to-do list and think, all right, what went wrong and what do I need to do to fix it? You should think about uh, your reaction to failure as gratitude. You are grateful for the lesson, not bitter about the setback or the disappointment. And this is also why it is so essential that you focus on the process and not the outcome. If you focus on the process, it is easy, or relatively easy, to make this reframing, to change your interpretation of failure to feedback, not uh, an indictment of you. Um, but if you are only focused on the outcome, and if that's all that matters to you, then it's going to be very difficult for you to treat failure maturely and appropriately and as a lesson uh, for learning. Number six, last point. Reframe success as feedback. Reframe success as feedback. I think this is just as important as understanding how to cope with failure. You should learn from your successes too. Uh, Nick Saban, who's, uh, I don't agree with all of his coaching philosophies, but I like this one. Um, but he's coached six NCAA national champion football teams. And he says, even when you win, you should study what you could have done better and plan how to improve next time. Adam Grant puts it slightly differently. He says, failure is not a better teacher than success. We're just more disciplined learners from failure than success. After hitting a goal, seek detailed feedback just like you do after missing a goal. What facilitated my success and what behaviors can I learn to repeat? This is what separates the greats from the goods. The goods, uh, the bads, don't learn from failure. The goods learn something from failure. The greats learn something from failure and from success and they relentlessly try to make improvements until there's just nothing more that they could do, until they've maxed out their potential. But you really can never do that, even if you're LeBron James, the great, probably the greatest basketball player of all time, or Tiger Woods, the greatest golfer of all time, uh, or whatever. Think of the, the most accomplished person in whatever field you're interested in. Mike Trout, the greatest baseball player of his current generation. There's always, he could always be better, but the, the idea, the, the greatness comes from always striving to max out, always striving to be the very best version of yourself. Um, Lorna Barca, I'll close with her quote. The best don't stop when they get their best results. They continue to make their best results better. And that's something that you can immediately start incorporating into your mindset as you take feedback and as you uh, deal with failure. You continue to make your best results better. So in conclusion, there's a reason that this type of training is so valued uh, and so invested in by Major League Baseball teams and other professional uh, sports organizations and by the military and by big business. And that's because it works. And that's because it enhances performance and it enables uh, people in high stress environments to succeed and to overcome the pressure uh, to build their confidence and to um, avoid choking. If you apply these lessons and continue to learn more uh, to debate, you can improve your mental toughness and you can boost your confidence and you can overcome your competitive anxiety and you can cope with setbacks and failures more effectively. And so that is what I have.